Hi, hello and welcome. My name is Terry Meir. I'll be your host today. Uh, we here at Sustainable Kashi are proud to provide these free classes for you to help connect us with our ecosystem. Uh, feel free to learn more about our project at sustainablekashi.com. Today, I am very excited. I actually have my celebration shirt on because we have Dr. Judy Golko with us today. She is amazing. Uh, she's one of the very first people I met in Florida on the permaculture scene, and she has just been kind and loving and authentic the entire time I've known her. So I'm really excited to have her here today as a presenter. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll make sure we get everybody's questions answered at the end um, so everyone gets heard. So Judy is a permaculture designer. Uh, she founded and co-organized the Rotary Community Gardens and Food Forests of Coral Springs. Uh, not only that, she also co-founded the Florida Permaculture Convergences that happened here in the state still uh, that are going on their seventh year. So she is just an amazing, amazing piece of the Florida permaculture scene. She's a PhD and a, li a licensed clinical psychology. Ooh, actually is exciting in itself uh, with a private practice in Coral Springs. So we're really, really excited to have her here. And uh, thank you, Judy, for taking time to be here and share all that you've learned with us. Thank you so much, Terry. It's really an honor for, to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, Terry and I met at the first uh, convergence at Wallaby Ranches with the uh, hang gliders going overhead. It was a really exciting time. And I look forward to when we can meet again. Um, and yeah, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, we're gonna focus today on you know, it's, it's a bit of a, I mean, how to get along and get things done, not easy, right? And um, as a clinical psychologist for three decades, I've learned a little bit about it and I've helped start and be part of groups. Also as a human, I've made tons of mistakes. So I'm gonna put those on display as well. And part of why I know what I know is because of what I messed up with. So I want to offer that to all of you and also talk about how we utilize uh, struggles in relationship, but how we can also try to maximize getting a working group together to get things done. I think I'm ready for the slides, Amy. Amy will kindly, uh, thank you so much. We couldn't figure out how to get me to do it. So Amy will be doing it. Yeah, this is my website. Um, so with one hat, I am a clinical psychologist in private practice in Coral Springs. And with another hat, I'm the co-organizer of the, of the garden. And I literally, part of that is splits and difficulties. I'm in my office four days. I'm in the garden two to three days. Um, okay, go on. There's, we have a Facebook group too, but I didn't put that on. Next slide. Oh, I, sound, I feel so official. Next slide, please. Okay. Permaculture, even social permaculture, which getting along with humans is of course part of. It's an invisible structure. And um, sometimes it's hard to think about. I won't go a lot in that, but it can be hard. We've had in our, in our community in Florida and in all the permaculture communities, even like, is that even real? I remember one time uh, in our garden, one of the, one of the guys said to me, uh, I had spent the week on the phone with the city. I wasn't in the garden because I was on the phone or sending emails. And when I went to the garden the next week, he said half jokingly, what do you even do? And uh, I hit him in the arm. So that was my skillful, uh, <laughs> skillful response. But it can be easy to not appreciate and not see the value in it um, because it's invisible. And we kind of only notice it when things break down. And, you know, just to touch on, often there can be a gender split, which we're not even aware of. So often men are doing what's visible, lifting up the heavy things. Um, and men, but also women are doing, lubricating behind the scenes. So it, it, it's complicated. And it can feel strange to think about it as a thing, but it's a thing, especially when it breaks down. Um, okay. So the thing is, I think, next slide, please. Oh, this is my goals for today. We can go back. Sorry, Amy. Um, briefly introduce it, talk about basic requirements, talk about common difficulties and hopefully helpful solutions. And then I want to open it up to questions and dilemmas that you might have. And I'll be following the slides, but also jumping off. 
Okay. So the thing is, when we can't get along with each other, uh, it's a limiting factor, right? It, that's a word. That's a word we use in permaculture. We can have the most, the best seeds. We can have best materials to make something of cob to grow things. But if we can't get along, uh, those things suffer. Okay, it deals with people care and fair share. So in permaculture, we have the three ethics, care for the earth, care for people, and fair share or resource share. And so we're talking about that. Okay, so to remind us all, people, plants, anything, the properties of regenerative systems, just to touch on it for people who are newer to permaculture, what, what is a successful system, whether it's humans or plants or whatever, it's, um, we're developing a system that will have lots of uh, multiple elements with multiple functions and functions have multiple elements so that we be, that there's redundancy. So if I'm out of town on a work day, there's still snacks because someone else is bringing the snacks. That's one way to look at it. Um, in, in crops, it's if this one fails, you still have that one. And with people, actually one of our goals is to become so redundant that we're not even necessary. Maybe we even move on and the system survives. Uh, we're looking for complexity, lots of interwoven relationships. We're looking for diversity and polyculture. And with maturity, there's more efficiency. And over time, we're increasingly using inputs from the system itself rather than having to export inputs. And um, just like we want a chicken to express all of who that chicken is, we want people to be able to express all of who they are as well. And find our unique niches. Next slide, please. So just real quick, these are the Holmgren's 12 permaculture uh, principles, uh, which you know hopefully we're familiar with. When it comes to people, one of the hardest and most important is number four, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. And I'll be talking about what's hard about that. Um, Nine, use small and slow solutions. I'll talk more about that, but if you're giving feedback to someone, you don't keep hammering them as an example of that. Um, value diversity, include everyone, be very slow to, to ask someone to leave, very slow, very rare. Include everyone, value the marginal, and in these times, use and respond to change. Oof. So also kind of practical and social design principles, everyone's connected. We think of individuals, but we think of the system. And it's really important for us to ask who is not here. Uh, it's easy for us to hang with who we're comfortable with and forget to ask who's not here, who needs to be here. It's a really important question. The problem is the solution. That's really good when you want to throttle someone to remember that there's value in what you're struggling with. Um, things move in circles. I'll talk a little more about this, but especially when you're setting up a group, it helps to know that you're gonna have this perennial growth pattern, which is things sleep, then they creep, then they leap and they reap. In other words, you're gonna have 16,000 meetings. It feels like you're getting nothing done. And then all of a sudden, like in the garden now, we barely need meetings. We used to have a million, the beginning and things leap and reap, if that makes sense. Um, taking responsibility, both physically and energetically, including looking within, very important, not easy. And again, ongoing learning to communicate. And um, some, I'm gonna emphasize this again, cause it's not an easy one for me. Face conflict, really hard for me and tolerate some conflict won't be resolved. I hate that. That's why I got into this field unconsciously to solve all conflict. Didn't work. It's still good. <laughs> okay. Next slide, please. This is us in the garden. This is, uh, we have a fenced in area with plots and a communal area. Um, this is on a work day. This is uh, part of our food forest area. And before we share the next slide, I want to share that um, we started the Coral Springs Garden. Um, the city, we were lucky, we were set up well. The city invited the Rotary Club to start a community garden. So we didn't have to like fight the city, they were supporting it. The Rotary Club were very sweet, but didn't have a clue what they were doing. 
after a million meetings, we had a coup of residents. The, the uh, Rotary Club kind of backed off and let us do what we wanted and supported us. And so we started with a fenced in area in 2009. We uh, started with the food forest outside the fenced in area in 2015, and we were slowly designing it. Uh, we're all volunteers, there's no one there full time. And tragically, um, in 2018, we had the Parkland school shooting, which I'm sure you've all heard about, or most of you have heard about. And that literally right up the road a mile from the garden. And also tragically, of the 17 people killed, one of them was the daughter of one of our gardeners. Uh, very sad, very tragic, very difficult. And that horrible and horrifying problem sort of uh, emerged into part of the food forest design then became uh, designing a memorial area as well. So we have a memorial area of the garden. If you uh, put the next slide. Oh, sorry, not this one. This is bananas. How could that be bad, right? Um, part of our produce, we literally hang it up and then people just pull them on as they come into the garden, they just pull a few off and, and bring home and eat. So that's yay, having a yield. And then the next slide. So this part of our garden is the Helena Freya Ramsey Memorial Garden. Um, these flowers, there was just unfortunately the third anniversary of the shooting and uh, this garden, the whole community, no one in, of our garden per se put these flowers there. People from the general Cor uh, Coral Springs and Parkland community uh, have put them there. We have 17 bamboo trees, one for each of those killed without any fanfare, some of those parents, some of those families, they come, they put a stone. Uh, we have Coral Springs rocks, which are like these little angels and fairies that come and put stones all over the garden and then kids come and they find them. So it's been so healing for people, especially during COVID uh, because people discovered the garden because they couldn't, all the, when all the parks were closed. So this terrible tragedy, uh, there became a solution and a space to hold that. Okay, when you put a working group together, so we're not talking other kinds of groups, social groups, therapy groups, we're talking a collaborative group that's trying to do a project. You need key requirements to even get off the ground, right? Just like if you're going to design a garden, you need space. If you're going to design a working group, you need safety, that's always implied. You need a shared intention, you need to more or less be on the same page. At the same time, a group of people will never 100% be on the same page, which is both frustrating and very illuminating. There's lots of edges to grow together. But if you're literally on two completely different pages, the project's unlikely to succeed. Uh, so you need that shared intention. Uh, what you also need, if you're going to have this kind of permaculture organic design, and I'm going to talk about this for a minute, you, you need a consent building, a consensus building, sociocratic um, type of process. Not that things can't get done with a traditional high, uh, top-down democratic process, but if you really want a group to organically grow, you need this process. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute. Um, Democracy is, you know, everyone has a voice, but then when you ultimately vote, majority rules, right? Consensus is, um, and I won't get, this is not, the, I mean, that could be a whole other talk. Uh, there could be exact, about all the ins and outs of it, but consensus, um, we're not gonna worry so much exactly about the dynamics of sometimes not everyone has to agree, but essentially you hear from everyone and there has, there, you, you keep working until you have consent and consensus from everyone, which I'll talk about, I think, on the next slide a little more. Egalitarian, um, in terms of philosophy, it's not hierarchy is evil. And honestly, most egalitarian or sociocratic things do have an organic hierarchy. You have a, a, a small council that makes most of the decisions because you don't have a hundred people, for example, deciding on what stapler to use. It doesn't work that way. And I'll talk more about that too. You need transparency and open communication. Um, you know, I've heard, um, you know, from, from 
if from my experience, let's say um, friends I have, female friends I have in, in the business world, if you're sitting there at meetings and talking about things, but kind of all the decisions get made on the golf course among a few guys and no one admits that, that's, that's not transparent, right? So if we really are saying that we meet together and we all have input, that has to be true and open communication. Okay, next slide, please. So consensus building, like I said, it's this perennial pattern and it's like soil building. So I'm sure some of you know, um, those of you who garden or are teaching people to garden, it can be very frustrating and slow at first, right? And people want quick solutions. What do I do? I have aphids all over, you know, my lettuce. Give me something to put on them. And so they're, right? And don't, it can be frustrating, the answers. Yeah, you could do that, but then it'll take you longer to build healthy soil. A lot of this answer, I don't know if any of you who teach people gardening, and this is often your answer, you have to keep building your soil, build healthy soil. And people are like, oh. And that's the same with humans too, right? If I have this ache and not to get all into it, I could take this medicine. But overall, if I'm working on soul building and building my body and healthy living, I am going to set things up for success. So again, you sit there with people with meetings. I'm gonna tell you the story of the bees. We talked about having bees come to our garden. And we went round and round for years. Some of us really wanted bees in the garden and some people were consistently opposed. No, we're on a public park. Kids will come, there's no, where we're thinking of having it isn't in the fence and they're gonna get hurt. And then you had a couple of our Jamaican gardeners are, you're all ridiculous. We had bees on every corner. You're all like way too scared and way too you know concerned about these bees are natural. Round and round we went because we were committed to not having bees until we had consent. Uh, I was very frustrated. I wanted bees. Um, one of the most valuable people in the garden who was against it was a guy who was gruff, not a great communicator, hard in the right place. And that's hugely important. He needed to be on board. He'd say, no, that's not safe. Okay, you're not comfortable. We have to keep talking. Eventually, um, the whole decision was taken away from us on one hand because the bee community in the area decided to build an apiary right behind our garden. So that happened. But that bee apiary, which had its own power struggles, bees in there not so happy. Meanwhile, we built a hugo culture and it was my, out of, I thought we, I was being so clever out of, we had, um, we had boards that were rotted from the first iteration of our garden boxes. And I thought, great, we'll build a hugo culture. But not realizing that if you're building a hugo culture with treated wood, it ain't gonna break down, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so we had this hugo culture that didn't break down and then some wild bees were like, oh, cool. Thank you for building this home for us. So these beings, while we were going around and around with the decision, then I learned maybe we don't want honeybees because that threatens the wild bee population. Well, these wild bees did not care what us humans were doing. They moved into this hugo culture and they are so healthy, so thriving. I've seen them split off at least twice to find another home. Uh, there's another bee colony now in a um, in an old tree. So that's the story of consensus building. Slow, frustrating. There's days where I quit. I hate that person. I want them off the council. And if you keep with it and you keep with it, it matures. And the wisdom that emerges is way beyond what you could conceive of. So that's that's consensus versus democracy slow and once it matures wow if you don't kill each other you know first <laughs> okay next slide please okay so this was just a quick note about hierarchy um ideally idealistically sociocracy we're all equal interconnected circles um realistically and i'll reiterate this later because i struggle with it 20 percent of the people in any group do 80 percent of the work and you have a council who does most of the decisions transparently, 
and then you have little circles but that this is how it works it doesn't maybe sometimes it works in these even intersect circles i haven't really seen that not that i've seen a million of them but this is often how it works um but the vision isn't top down the vision is egalitarian if that makes sense okay so i talked about those elements that are important shared safety shared intentions um egalitarian and uh consensus and also having glue and this word is from diane leaf christian i have references at the end uh she lives in uh earth haven where i visited in august which was awesome and uh, she writes about building community so you have to remember to not just work not just struggle but also even if they're your best friends they're just a working group but celebrate celebrate your goals have fun make food, have food, eat food, music, uh, super important to have glue for, for a working group. Okay, next. And again, maybe I'm having to always remind myself, so I offer it to you, there will be difficult personalities. And then there will be, everyone is sometimes difficult. And I'm one of those people. So I know that well, I'm not, I'm a little, I continue to mature but I can be opinionated, controlling, bossy, arrogant. I know everything. Um, and then there will be, but I also work hard, but you're gonna have some people who are just always difficult. Uh, again, except that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Conflict can be difficult. I don't like conflict. Some people maybe thrive on it. I really don't like it. Um, and some conflict really won't be resolved. Uh, I didn't put them in a reference, but I don't know if any of you know the Gottmans. They are marital therapists. And uh, they talk about in the most successful marriages, there are a number of arguments that never get resolved. And that's not important for a good marriage. Uh, the key things are uh, respect and communication. Some conflicts are just going to be ongoing. So. Okay, so just real quick, it helps to know, just like when you're working with a chicken, what are its needs, right? What are its products, what are its needs? Um, I'm sure this isn't everything, but people need to feel secure and that they matter, uh, that their voice is heard, to feel connected, to not feel overly shamed or called out or rejected. We really fight against that. We we're built to wanna be part of a group and to be an important member of the group. And what is important is different for every person. Uh, to, to express ourselves and to find our niches, we really shine then. And our niche can change. And again, if you have a culture where it's very rare to have someone leave, that adds to safety. Okay, so the challenging edge when working with humans, and um, I, I guess I need to qualify, you know, from my experience and in this country and i'm from canada so not all the countries and not all the norms but i think some of this is human nature is to be a successful working group ecosystem every person needs to take responsibility and be open to feedback and change however when we're threatened we close down we're defensive so we're working that edge and um like every edge there's so much richness and stretching there like I'm, I'm doing a 21 day yoga challenge. Uh, thank God it's only 20 minutes because I've consented to it. And today I was on the mat and at minute 10, I'm like, you've got to be effing kidding me. I hate this, I quit. Stretching, stretching, but I didn't quit. And I felt great at 20 minutes. So we need want to stretch and we also need to take breaks. We want to be open. And we also are going to close up when we feel defensive. That's just how we work. Also, once our identity is formed, we tend to resist change initially at first. I'm a this, I'm not a that. Uh, that's just how we work. Okay, human conflict dynamic tendencies. Um, I, I feel like this is a lot. Hopefully, hopefully though, each of these could be an hour, but I just wanted an overview of some key things that are hopefully helpful and still hopefully have some time for discussion. I think we will. So this is in the reference, Stephen Cartman talked about this drama triangle. When there's conflict, uh, both within an individual, within a diet or within a group, we tend to polarize in these ways. Uh, so let's say you're having a, a disagreement with some people. Um, someone is, will be the persecutor, someone will be the one persecuted on, and someone else will be the rescuer. 
I tend to be the rescuer. Of course, the rescuer has, it's like, it's fine. It's okay. No, we'll figure it out. And um, none of these roles is more valuable than any other. Rescuer sounds good, but uh, who was it before? Kathy was mentioning resentment. So I'll be rescuing and I'm giving and everything's fine. And then deep down, I, I'm suddenly in my persecutor. I'm pissed. I hate everyone. I've worked too hard. I haven't delegated. I'm trying to save everyone, which wakes up my inner persecutor. I hate everyone, if that makes sense. Um, so we have this dynamic going on inside. And then we have this dynamic going on outside. And it's important to know because that persecutor isn't really a persecutor. That victim, and it could be anything. The victim can be, um, we'll have some gardeners who never fulfill all of their 12 hours a year volunteer work. When you talk to them, they're the victim. How dare you approach them? It's not fair. They're doing so much, which they're not. They're not noticing. I'll get into that more, but no one's ever fully a victim, if that makes sense. No one's ever fully a persecutor. No one's ever fully a rescuer. And depending, we all go round and round with others and with ourselves. Really helpful to know that so we can start to have solutions to that. Okay. So this is what I was saying before. Um, the place where we think and have perspective, especially is in the prefrontal cortex. Um, when we're threatened, we're having an amygdala hijack, our inner limbic system in the mid part of the brain gets literally, if you took a, 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 a photo of, of blood flow, you would see more blood flow to that part and no blood flow. There'll be no blood going here when I'm super ashamed or super defensive or super angry. I can't think. Really helps to know that, both how you approach others and for compassion for yourself. So this is, I, I'm still playing with, I'd love feedback. This is a slide I came up with. I did this chart one day, um, that's kind of my second story, when a gardener was bitching at me about something I did, a gardener who they perceived I did, who never, in years, never fulfills all their hours, only complains. So I was so pissed, I just started writing and I drew this chart, okay? So that person was in the, um, in the top left quadrant. So Along the bottom, you have in any group, you have people who do less than their share, right? You have people who do their share and people who do more than their share, right? Does that make sense? I can't see everyone, but okay. Then across the top, I put, you have people who complain a lot, people who really don't say much, people who have a lot of solutions, and then people who complain and have solutions. So this person definitely falls in that quadrant of people who complain a lot and don't do their share. So it's just helpful for me to lay that out. Um, so what is the solution? You don't listen to what they say, what they're complaining about, because people have to earn that, not by being rich or being famous, but by sweat equity, right? You listen to people, if they're just complaining, and I used to get so mad, and this helped me to know, you don't have to listen to what they're saying, but observe the pattern. Are there suddenly more of that then what's going on in the group or in the culture at large? Is there less of that? But there's always gonna be some of that. And if I like to joke, if you're a leader and no one's ever pissed at you, you're not doing your job right, right? Because <laughs> someone's gonna be pissed at you. So that, okay. Um, if we go along the top, it's really pretty rare for someone who does less than their share to talk solutions, right? So it's good to know. Um, to put it in perspective. So if we go along the middle, um, people who do their share, if they're complaining, you gotta be open to feedback, right? They're doing their share, they're showing up. If they're complaining, you'd be open to feedback. Um, something personally about me, which I'm a little less ashamed of, I come from a narcissistic father. If I feel, sometimes if I'm feeling secure, I don't feel threatened, but if I feel threatened, what I've learned is that person has a good idea and I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> so I'm, I work with that feeling in my gut of, ooh, I wanna shut down. Wait, what's going on? Oh, solution, they have a really good idea. Cause when it's not a great idea, I don't feel threatened. Now I know there's more evolved beings than me and I see them in my garden every day, other people on the committee who seem to never feel threatened when someone has a good idea. I don't love that about myself but I've learned to work with that. Oh, I feel threatened. They must have a good idea. Okay. 
Now, a lot of people are here where it says majority supporters, people who aren't desiring active leadership roles, but they like to show up and they like to do their share and they're not saying much. And that is what supports your working group, right? Not everyone is going to be sharing their ideas about how things should go. And a lot of people are going to delight and support and that's really valuable and you can't do anything without that. And then again, you have to listen going further along. Sometimes people do their share and talk solution. Sometimes people complain and talk solutions. And then the last one, if I am hoping this is clear, um, when people do more than their share and they say there's a problem, you totally listen. Uh, and in these last two boxes on the, the, the bottom and the right, that's kind of what's traditional leadership. People who do more than their share and who are solution focused and also note the problems and solutions. So I kind of came up with this. I hope it's helpful. Okay, let's keep going because I do want time. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do with these conflicts? Okay, none of us are gonna be perfect, but it really helps to start with compassion, empathy and generosity for ourselves and the other person. It's like, you're totally, if you're like me, you're not mild mannered inside, like you're totally annoying me right now. Um, but I'm also gonna, but I remember all the valuable things you've done and I love you. And I'm gonna assume, like if I do something thoughtless, I think, oh, I just feel stressed. We tend to go, if you do something thoughtless, you're an asshole, right? So we have to reel that in and go, hang on. You just, maybe you were stressed, Assume generosity unless you have a lot of evidence to the contrary. And you're, I can't do that in every moment. There's been times where I've been literally like, okay, I quit. And I love the quote of Joan Rivers of Blessed Memory, uh, where she once said on one show, never talk to me again for five seconds. <laughs> right? I quit in this moment. I have no frontal cortex. I hate you all. I hate myself. I'm going home. And I'll try again tomorrow, right? Just that generosity. Okay. Um, when you're when you're confronting someone, Diane Leaf Christian, another thing she talks about is many drops. So first of all, if I just say something to you and no one else does, and you're feeling defensive and justified, you won't hear it. But if several people are consistently saying, hey, you know, you do this thing, I'm gonna start to listen. And I'm gonna to start to listen and I may say it from out of my mouth, that's ridiculous, I don't know what you're talking about, but then I'll go home and I'll think about it and I'll be a little embarrassed and I'll change my behavior and I may never admit it. And it's important to not kind of force people to admit things, uh, let people save face, give feedback and then stop when they're overwhelmed because nothing good's gonna happen if you keep pushing. That's another small drop. So a little dose, back off. That happens also, just gonna briefly touch on, again, because it's in my experience, male-female dynamics. Often we women complain in every space, including our Florida permaculture space, we're not being heard. I don't know any guy who has consciously decided not to hear on a conscious level. These things are unconscious. Men are used to hearing men. Uh, in the Obama administration, he hired a lot of women, very excited, but the women's voices weren't heard at the meetings. So the woman devised this um, setup where as soon as one woman would say something, typically what happens is a meeting, and this has happened so often in the garden, is a woman will say something, no one will really hear, a guy will say the same thing, and everyone's like, that's such a great idea, right? If any of you women, I don't, can't see everyone, but I'm guessing that a lot of you have felt that. Okay. So in the Obama administration, I can't remember exactly what committee, a woman would say something, another woman would echo and amplify her voice. And that was very effective. Um, it's not necessarily wrong to say to someone, I need you to look at your unconscious sexism. It's, it's also, if we're constantly black, on the one hand, people should do that. But on the other hand, when you constantly blast people, they're gonna shut down and not hear you. So we're working with that balance. Um, and it's important for all of us to learn to say, I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. Thank you for letting me know, I will work on that. It's not easy guys. 
Um, also, sandwich statements that are easy to receive with caring statements. Because the implicit, we forget to say, if you are, I can't tell you how many times a stranger, a man has come to the garden and starts lecturing me on what I've planted. Oh, do you know that's pigeon peas? Um, I don't care if it's a, so I'll just go, oh, that's so interesting. Tell me more, having a little fun for myself. But if I care about someone, I'm only giving you this negative feedback because I care about you. But let me remember to, I value you, but let me remember to say that. Listen, this is hard for me, but I really care about you and I really value you. So I need you to know this thing. All of us receive that better. Okay. And then when you notice something helpful, focus on that, build on that. I, we're so near the end, but everyone should know about nonviolent communication coming from I statements. When you do this thing, I feel not valued or I feel not, you know, I feel, I feel angry because I don't feel valued and I need to feel valued. So would you please, when I ask you to listen to something, listen more carefully. Uh, that's all we can say about that right now. It's really important. But I also want to say there are some people who are never going to be able to talk this way. And we have to let that go. That's part of the un- going conflict. Some of our most valuable members have been like, that's wrong. You got to do it like this. But they're out there for 12 hours straight, the first to give the shirt off their back to everyone. You have to look at that. This is good to practice. Some of us, it comes easier to. Some of us, it's an, it ain't ever going to happen. And you can't kind of, you know what I mean? Like hold people to this purity. There's also, cultures are very different about this. Different cultures are very different about this. Part of this is that is white value. And again, that could be a whole other 20 lectures. Yeah, so when you have your working group up and running with all the conflict that you've endured, um, there's such enjoyment, such meaning, such creativity. You don't need so many meetings anymore. Um, you kind of just need to look at each other with a lifted eyebrow. You know what each other is talking about. Oh, she's doing that thing again, all right. And you, you get incredible things done. <laughs> That's just the ending, like, yay, we're at the garden. Okay, so, um, oh, and so I just want, this just happened, so I wanted to show this in, as an example. I actually don't know much about it, but Joan O'Nugger and his regenerative design group just switched to a worker-owned cooperative. So I think that's really an exciting permaculture thing to know as part of this model we're talking about. He talked briefly that, um, yeah, this was his statement. I thought this was so important. Um, I do want to get to questions, but basically that they wanted to have these values, but they fell into a more hierarchical approach and finally figured out how to actually build this cooperative uh, original vision of employee ownership. So now I would love to hear, you know, and I, Terry, I guess, well, you know, however you want to feel this, I'd love to hear any dilemmas, any struggles, it, it needs to be kept, of course. Um, please talk in generalities and don't name or call anybody out at this point near the end. And by the way, uh, from the African-American community, I would suggest we adopt calling in instead of calling out. And I love that because you're only going to say difficult things to people you care about. You're calling them in. But yeah, now I, I'd like to hear any questions or Thank thoughts. you. I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, that's That was absolutely beautiful. And it's it's wonderful. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Jono because I actually, uh, he's on our speaker list. Now he's going to mm. be sharing a class with us and he's just such a wonderful example in how to mix community with uh, social interaction. So it's really nice that uh, you've gotten to share in his work and I'm not at all surprised. Um, we do our three week program here for our Kashi uh, interns and we really get to practice that interacting, you know, on a social level and working in the garden. And I can't count the times that people are working in the garden, look up at me and they're like, oh wait, this really has little to do with gardening. And that's what I really love about permaculture is once you start diving into the components and then you, I mean, you can spend your whole life in the social permaculture world and never even touch a seed. Yep. So it's really amazing that you've spent the time to uh, share that aspect with us. And I wanted to ask you if you could share a story of uh, where you saw social permaculture really change someone's life and move them from uh, 
internal either unhappiness. I've seen so many gardens that look great, yet the inner, inner landscape is just destroyed. Oh, it's a great question. Real briefly, one of our gardeners um, who's very active uh, struggled with a lot of depression. She's had a lot of loss. And she started to take on a role in leadership and really felt overwhelmed and intimidated until she found her niche. She doesn't like to be part of making the decisions, but she likes to carefully craft and be part of the solution. And once we all realize that, like at one point I'm like, gosh, she's not even, she doesn't even reply all to the messages. It's because she's intimidated. But once she found her niche, she lovingly cares for the memorial, like amazing. Uh, it makes her day. So there are so many stories like that. People finding their niche and quietly doing their things. And this is a very relevant topic for me because I do live in a community with about a hundred people. And as you can imagine, social interaction is one of the most difficult things uh, to, to navigate. Really um, is. Was curious if you had any implementation ideas on how to actually start the conversation in a group. It could be a family or, you know, a hundred people of how to actually start that conversation of either nonviolent communication or um, how, to, how to interact socially. Well, first, it's always important to assess is this truly toxic? In which case, there needs to be more like separation and boundaries, or at least to start. Is it toxic and unsafe, or is it just anxiety provoking and difficult? Uh, and so, in the latter case, I try to remember to start from my own vulnerability. Like, I'm really scared to say this, but this is really important to me, or I, I should have brought this up a long time ago, but I just didn't know how to do it blah, blah, blah. So starting with the eyes, giving the gift of vulnerability. If I want you to be vulnerable, I need to be vulnerable. Now, I regularly forget that, mind you, and I'll be like, you need, uh, oh, wait, wait, let me rephrase that. Um, but I would start with that vulnerability. It's hard. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful. Thank I'm really, you. really grateful that you're doing the work you're doing and because it's, it, it, weaves through all of our tapestries and it really helps connect us all. Mm. And I can honestly say that's one of my favorite qualities about you working on leadership teams, working on things with you. You've always just been open and you hear everyone. So thank you for thank that work you, you do. Um, can you tell us where to find you to find more information about uh, uh, the work you're doing? Yeah, so I'm easy to find on the web in terms of my uh, psychology business. It's just jgulko.com, um, j-g-u-l-k-o.com, the garden. So you can look us up on Facebook, uh, the Rotary Community Garden and Food Forest of Coral Springs. It's a mouthful. I know I'll say it again, the Rotary Community Garden and Food Forest of Coral Springs. And um, on my first slide, I have, we have a WordPress blog as well, but it's escaping me exactly what it's called. I have it on my first slide. Excellent. Yeah. And if we can, uh, we can, I'd love to continue this conversation in our Facebook community group. If anybody has any detailed questions or situations we could share, I think that'd be a wonderful place for that to happen. Uh, and that's on the uh, Sustainable Kashi community page. And, uh, I really want to thank you, Judy, for taking the time with us. And uh, thank you, Amy Zelt, our production manager, for doing thank all you, behind Amy. the scenes work, making it all happen. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's your donations. It's your time that makes this all possible. And we wouldn't be here without you. So thank I'm you also, very much. I'm also typing into the chat. Uh, we've had um, uh, our friend, a garden friend, David Stack, has a YouTube channel, Stacks Urban something. And um, he's done a couple of videos on our garden. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Of all of the systems in permaculture I've seen, uh, it's the social ones that usually face the most challenges. And I've seen them have direct reflections on the beauty of the gardens themselves. And as I walk oh. through someone's gardens and I see the flowers blooming and I see every all the things working together, I realize that they've got an understanding of the social aspect because ultimately permaculture is relationships and it's relationships with us and the environment. It's our connection into nature. And the better we get at that skill, the better all our gardens will thrive. So thank you everyone for joining us in this conversation. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Judy. Mm -hmm.
Bye, everybody.